world this week, seven days, four Paris based correspondents, one hour. We're in the company of Regis Le Semi, associate editor in chief at a French news weekly magazine, Paris Match, your latest book in French, Dash, the story so far. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. Uh, also uh, with us, British journalist Jana Jalil. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Welcome as well to Aaron Zaleski, Paris correspondent for The Daily Beast. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And uh, Andre Neto, correspondent for uh, Brazilian weekly O Estado de São Paulo. Hi. Did I say that right? Yeah, uh, it's a daily newspaper, but anyway. Da Why did I say weekly? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it's certainly been a, a week where it's felt uh, every day has been a chock-a-block. You Brazil. can imagine. We're going to talk about it. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, our hashtag World This Week. She's been impeached and suspended as Brazil's president. But if you felt Dilma Rousseff would go quietly, think again. What's at stake in this impeachment process is not only my mandate. What's at stake is respect for the ballot box, the sovereign will of the Brazilian people and the constitution. What's at stake is the future of the country and the opportunity and hope to always advance further. And after that 55-22 vote, the Senate will now decide whether to permanently remove Rousseff over financial mismanagement. She's not directly implicated in that Petrobras corruption scandal that's brought down politicians from all sides. Andre Neto, she said, I made mistakes but committed no crime. And you know what? It's true. And that's the, the paradox of the Brazilian crisis. Uh, I don't see uh, many uh, politicians uh, as uh, honest as we can uh, imagine Dilma Rousseff is. And, uh, you know, uh, she's impeached. She's uh, waiting for the uh, Senate decision in the next 180 year, uh, days. And uh, we have in, in the power right now a vice president that is uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a very uh, strange person and uh, not very well known by the, the not Brazilian... Not very well known. He's 75 years old. He's been around forever, it seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, politics. that's true. That's true. But, uh, uh, you know, we are discovering today that uh, the, the Brazilian centrist party, PMDB, it's not as centrist as we thought it is. Actually, it's a very conservative party. And uh, uh, his uh, ministry, for example, uh, for education is a uh, very, let's say, orthodox uh, uh, religious man. How are we discovering this now? This was the party that was uh, allied with the Workers' Party of Dilma Rousseff and Lula da Silva. Isn't it a mess, the Brazilian political system? That's, that's my question also. Uh, I am a Brazilian journalist and I'm asking myself, how can we, Brazilian journalists, uh, discover that the, the, the centrist party is not as centrist as we thought. Many papers uh, this Friday headlining how 25% of Brazilians are white men, but they now make up 100% of the cabinet. It is urgent to calm down the nation and unify Brazil. It is urgent to form a government to rescue the nation. Regis Le Sommier, your reaction to the turn of events we've seen this week? Well, it's, it's bizarre because uh, on the paper, I mean, looking at it from afar, uh, you can see, you could see that it's an exercise that there is a country who is actually taking matters of corruption it's in its own hands and, put, you know, casting aside its own president, which is unknown to me. I mean, there's um, been some threat of impeachment in the U.S., some, some rumors that, you know, in France, it's really hard to remove the president. So you could see, you could say, is it really? And then you discover, as we said, uh, that uh, that guy has, you know, sort of a bizarre, um, and I think he has Lebanese origin. Mm -hmm. And didn't, didn't you tweet, I think, uh, that? Uh, it was a retweet. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, but uh, it was a, a funny one that oh, Lebanon is not able to find a president. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but but, but it, it, it's interesting, and and so, but you know, now we're discovered, and we're not to the bottom of that story. I guess you know, there's there's a lot of things that is going to be ongoing, and and the world's going to be watching very closely because it's, you know because of the the Olympics coming up, because of a lot of things, and because of the shape of of the the, the position Brazil has taken in the in the last years. 
Regis, they're putting the finger on something. We have competing narratives about Brazil. On the one hand, how this anti-corruption scandal is shaking the tree to try to stop the rod, and it's really shaking up politics and uh, putting an end to one party's rule of 13 years. And on the other, th th this idea that the, the new guys are turning back the clock in some way. I think the the issue here, but again, I'm no expert on Brazilian politics, but the refrain I keep hearing is that she's a scapegoat, basically, that the issue is not really about corruption. I mean, in fact, according to uh, Transparencia Brasil, more than 300 uh, Brazilian congresspeople are currently under investigation for corruption. So it's a bit difficult to believe that with so many people in the government facing corruption investigations, that the impeachment charges would be related just to the corruption. What I keep hearing is that people are blaming her for the current state of the economy because she mm. managed the economy quite badly, apparently. And that's the reason that she's basically trying to be un unseated via these corruption charges for the impeachment. Is she a scapegoat, Jen Antonio? I, I totally agree. It's, it's more about the economy than just the corruption allegations. In terms of being just a scapegoat, you have to remember she was the chairperson of the state oil giant Petrobras for many of the years when these alleged uh, corrupt deals were going on. And she's also accused of uh, fiddling the budget figures in order to make them better than they were so she could win re-election a couple of years ago. What I find really shocking is uh, that... Uh, in the, just two decades, Brazil is going from being this emerging global powerhouse where millions of people have been lifted out of poverty by the Workers' Party to now being in this huge mess. And people are blaming Dilma Rousseff for that, the fact that the economy is failing, inflation is high, unemployment is high. She's seen as not having managed the situation well. Whether she herself is, is clean or not, I think is slightly beside the issue. She's seen as having presided over this huge recession. And so she is now being punished for that uh, by other Congress people. And she is accusing them of being misogynistic and she's saying that they're they are they are using this as a way to get rid of her and to, to for the old interest to get back into power but it has also to be said that the workers party has mishandled this and i think one of the things that told against her was her attempts to protect her predecessor luis inacio lula da silva when allegations about him emerged and uh, he was a, a great president he was seen as having done so much to help ordinary and poor brazilians but now i think this whole party has become smeared perhaps they've been too long in power the media has been a big part of the story Andre Neto, uh, first of all, the discrepancy between the way this story has been covered from abroad and the way it's been covered from inside Brazil. Yeah, that's that's quite surprising, actually. Uh, first of all, I'm surprised by the fact that the, the, the foreign correspondents in Brazil are, are getting the, the complexity of the whole story. Uh, it's uh, the, the big picture. It's very well explained abroad. That that's that's a, a, a very good thing. Um, what can I say about the Brazilian press? It's a, it's a difficult... We saw, we saw uh, just, you know, on Thursday uh, outside the presidential palace when she was packing her bags, people uh, really making uh, attacks from the Workers' Party supporters, making attacks on, on a press that they consider to be um, the, the mouthpiece of the oligarchs. And I, I can understand. I think it's a bit radical, but I, I can understand this, uh, this way of thinking about the Brazilian press. Uh, it's, it's a very conservative press. Let's, let's uh, face the, the reality. And uh, uh, I'm afraid we, uh, we are in the need of a, a balance, uh, a, a progressist uh, press in Brazil. And uh, th that's a shame, I'd say. That's a shame. All right, so two more questions for you. First of all, what's going to happen now with this anti-corruption scandal. Are, are the prosecutors going to go forward or is he, or are they going to put a lid on everything? That's one of the main questions right now. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a good chance to, to, to you know, the, the, the process will, will continue. The, all the proceedings and in, in, uh, the, the prosecutors will uh, work well in the coming uh, weeks since the institutions are uh, stronger than with we could suppose a couple of weeks ago, uh, but uh, there are some some doubts, and I think they are legitimate. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, something else could could happen if the the justice ministry, uh, for example, uh, you know, asks for the the, the federal policy to uh, to face different uh, kind of crimes in Brazil, like. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, drugs uh, or, or something else, you know, uh, th that's an intelligent strategy for a government that's trying to sh uh, shift 
the, the, the attention of the, the Brazilian public opinion. And then finally on this, uh, Dilma Rousseff herself, the margin is wide in that impeachment vote, 55-22. Can she win in her Senate trial? Can she overcome it and, and remain in office at the end of the day? I don't think so. But I think at the end of the day, in the Brazilian scenario, everything is possible. At the end of six months, maybe something can happen, uh, could even she, in justice, could she be for example. Pro prosecuted? And oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. In jail, and but uh, in jail, hard to say. I think Lula is mm -hmm. the main uh, target yes, of the justice definitely. right now, and uh, he's. Uh, I, I can understand he's a target, a more interesting target for the justice than Dilma Rousseff, since Certainly he has symbolic. been, yes, he symbolic, was and he has system. been yeah. the head of the Workers' mm. Party yes. since the 80s. So, mm. But even if she survives this impeachment process, can she come back or will she be just too damaged? That's uh, another good question. Uh, she has no support in the, in the chambers, first of all. It's, so it's very difficult to, to govern in the, in the, in the, whole, the whole situation. Uh, to be honest, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I've been in, in contact with Dilma Rousseff for the last 15 years, and uh, I, I think she's uh, she's not well prepared for this uh, this you know charges uh, for 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 being president. I, I mean, and uh, I think she doesn't like the power. That's something important, and uh, I'm I'm she's not, not very convinced. Woman. Yeah. I'm not very convinced that uh, she will fight really but she's fought so to, hard to come back to, to, to for the past few months to resist this process. She's resistant. She's a she's a fighter. That's that's for real. Uh, but um, I, I'm asking myself who is going to lead this fight right now, if it's Lula, if it's Dilma. And I, I, I don't think Dilma has this, uh, you know, I, she, I don't feel Dilma fighting for coming back to the power in these uh, circumstances. All right. We're going to continue, of course, to follow it as it all unfolds. It was the week that saw in the Philippines the election of a foul-mouthed populist mayor who'd been dubbed the Filipino Trump, while over in Washington, the genuine article was paying a first-ever call on the most powerful Republican on Capitol Hill, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who as late as last week didn't see himself endorsing the real estate mogul come reality TV star. So has Paul Ryan come around? I was very encouraged with this meeting, um, but this is a process. It takes a little time. You don't put it together in 45 minutes. Uh, so that is why um, we had, like I said, a very good start to uh, a process on how we unify. He's not over it, Aaron Zaleski, is he? No, no. I, th I think what people need to realize is that Paul Ryan was one of Trump's most outspoken critics. Uh, back in December, he was the one, after Trump made his comments regarding banning Muslims from the U.S., it was Paul Ryan who said, this is not what our, our uh, country stands for. It's not what our party stands for. He, he was quite clear. And I just I feel like their views are so divergent that Paul Ryan is just in a really bad place right now. He's, a, he's in a very sort of between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, he's ne he hasn't, as, as people have mentioned, he hasn't uh, outright endorsed Trump. But on the one hand, not to get behind him, they run the risk of another Democratic presidency. They run the risk of a you know, greater uh, divisive. How, how badly did he want to be drafted at the convention instead of Trump? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another, another topic for another day. There's, there's that as well. But uh, yeah, on the one hand, he, he risks you know, the party losing further ground. On the one hand, if he if he doesn't get back you know, behind him, but on the other hand, if he he ends up backing him and the the campaign's a complete catastrophe, then he has to answer to that later. And if he's himself, people have said also in the political press in Washington that he might be considering a presidential run in the future. So what he does or doesn't do is really going to affect his political future as well. Uh, Regis Le Sommier, uh, Trump's candidacy when he announced it was a big joke. Then uh, when he starts to do well. Uh, they say, oh, uh, it, it, it won't have, it won't continue. Then the others um, band together to try to stop him. Mm -hmm. They talk about it. None of that's happened, of course. No, none of that happened. Happened, and I think what uh, what Trump did yesterday is is really remarkable. I think he's uh, he's come to you know the conclusion. You know, he's 
he started his uh, move to, I mean, first joining the, the Republican Party and then making making it to the center, because that's probably what he's going to do. The other, the only guy who's, who's left in the field is Mitt Romney. I mean, the, most of the other guys have not publicly endorsed him, or, but, you know, they said they didn't, you know, he, he got a call from Lindsey Graham, uh, who said that they had an interesting conversation. So I think the, little by little, the, the Republican Party is going behind Trump, and that as I said, Romney is the exception, but Trump is, you know, unifying the party when he wants to, and he's now, you know, the one in charge. And 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 really, I don't see. I mean, he's going to put his strategy. And you know what? The decisive factor that the Republicans are going to be, go behind him is Hillary Clinton. They're not going to go for Hillary Clinton. Nobody or very little part of the Republican Party would go for, for, for Hillary Clinton. The, 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 the gap is too weak, too wide, and that's why Ch uh, Trump is, is maneuvering, I think, quite remarkably right now. Jenna Jalil, is, is it, uh, are, are we in Europe also coming around to the concept that he's the Republican nominee and that's it? Oh, I think it's just so hard for, for a lot of people to accept even now. And, and you say that uh, Republicans will, will back Trump, mm -hmm. but a lot of them have said that actually they'd rather vote for Hillary yes. than vote for Trump. Well, look, what, just, look at just what happened in so West Virginia. I mean, the offensive. Republicans went to vote for Bernie Sanders in order for him to win the state. So in the, in the core Republican you know, people, they're going to go for Trump. What we know about Donald even Trump? Even though he's not a religious person, even though you know, he has a lot of drawbacks, we know that. He's but totally at the end of the day, unpredictable, though, isn't he? You know, and he's very vain. He's very thin-skinned. He takes offence. He can insult people. He can say racist things, yeah, sure. Islamophobic things, sexist things. He said quite insulting things. So lots well, of people. Well, a number people. of those things that and the so Republicans can handle. A lot of people with. are very worried about what image he will project of an American president. We've had the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, talking about uh, but how you're he talking about the elite people. You're talking about the press. You're talking about all the people uh, wants uh, all the people. Uh, Trump has been, you know, running well, I'm against. I'm also talking about women so, and know, ethnic minorities. De definitely, who are going but to decide talk the about the voters election. because if Trump won, it's because a lot of Americans, people, including people from women, uh, don't like him, and that's no, half the population. No, but how did it have this huge turnout? Uh, on the well, primary, are, the best turnout ever for a GOP can candidate. There is a I mean, sizable constituency in the Republican Party of angry. White men. No, not uh, only. I mean, that's, 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 that's the usual jobs. rhetoric. That's the usual rhetoric. We've Who? heard that for years. We've heard that for ever since Trump. But little by little, we're coming to the conclusion. And now, who? What can stop? Stop? Honestly, honestly, tell me what can stop Trump from having the, from being the Republican candidate? Well, Nothing. All right, we're going to pick so, up. We're going to pick <laughs> up on this when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the world this week. <laughs>